And welcome to Celebration Community Church. We are so glad that you're here this morning. As you can see, I have nothing in my hands because as I was walking up the aisle, I realized I left all my notes sitting on my desk. So this will get really exciting here in just a few minutes, particularly as I try to work my way through the announcements. I'm fine. I'm fine. Thank you. They're checking. Do you want them? And I'm going, no, not at this point. We were saying a moment ago, and good morning to those who are, visit, who are worshiping with us online. I don't ever want to ignore you all. We're grateful you're with us as well. We are a church of extravagant hospitality and tradition without judgment. And we live that out every day in our experience together as a community of faith. So I'm glad you're part of this community of faith. Let me share with you several announcements today. And if I leave something out, I'm very happy for someone to raise their hand, wave it wildly in the air, and I'll call on you and you can tell me what I've left out. Um, we do have the gathering on Wednesday night. So when you take the red books, which are in the pew, in the pew center aisle, take that red book, put your name in it. If you're coming to the gathering, tell us you're coming to the gathering. One other thing I need you to do when you get the red book, because I'm skipping around in my announcements here. Our fall festival is this coming Saturday at 11 a.m. And if you are going to sign up to play cornhole or I learned about cornhole about 15 years ago. I still can't get over the name of the game. But if you're going to play cornhole or pitch horseshoes, list, put that next to your name in the red book. And that way we'll know because we'll know who's entering those competitions. Not that we compete at celebration, but nonetheless. So please do that in the red book. If you're visiting with us, put your name in the red book. Put some contact information, a phone number, an email address, so that we can be in touch with you and we can tell you about all the neat things that are happening here at celebration. So red books, visitors, Fall Festival. The other thing that's happening this coming Saturday is Sandwich Saturday starting at 9.30. It's a different start time because we're going to segue from that straight into the Fall Festival. And we'd love to have you come to make sandwiches. These go to the folks over at the Presbyterian Night Shelter. But they really depend on these. One of the things that we need, if you would, when you come, we need more jam. I was told not to ask for jelly. Jam spreads better. I didn't know that. I've just learned something new. So come be with us. I'll have the pastor's table set up. If you've got children, if you've got neighbors with children, bring them along as well. We're all going to learn how to make peanut butter jelly sandwiches together. So that's also this Saturday. Wednesday night, the gathering. I mentioned that. If you're coming to the gathering, please note that in the red book for us. Catherine Godby will speak, be speaking this coming Wednesday night. She'll be talking about how her faith intersects with her work in the Justice Network. Uh, I will be returning from California Wednesday night which is one of the reasons why Catherine's going to be speaking, but also I want you to hear from her. Next Wednesday night, the 23rd, at the gathering, Randall Story is going to be talking about how his faith intersects with his work. And so this is an opportunity to hear from each other and then share some conversation about that because that's an important and critical topic for all of us. How does our faith impact how we live the rest of our week and the rest of our lives? So let's remember those things. What am I leaving out? Black tie. Black tie. Boy, I'm glad I didn't forget that. Black tie is coming up quickly, and we are selling individual tickets. We need to fill some tables. So if you would love to go to black tie, call the church office, talk to Pam. Pam will give you all the information you need. If you can't go, but you want to sponsor somebody to go, call Pam, same information, let her know that. That's coming up quick. Related to that is the raffle. And on the, where's the poster? Is it in the fireside room? In the fireside room. There's a QR code. If you're like me, you have to have somebody younger show you how to do this. But if you're not like me, take your phones out, open a camera app, tap on that code, and you can take part in that raffle. That, again, is another important way of supporting Black Tie Dinner. That's important because Black Tie Dinner supports Celebration Community Church. So let's not forget about that. Other announcements today. Rides for early voting. Thank you, Randy. Early voting opens not tomorrow, but next Monday, the 21st. We only have a 10-day early voting window this year. If you need a ride to the polls, talk to Randy. Talk to or call the church office, and we will help you find a ride to an early voting place in order to participate in this incredibly important election. Any other announcements today? Cakes. Cakewalk. 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 See, Pam's over here. She just has to give me a word, and it all comes to me all one <laughs> Not that we're competitive, but we do have cakewalk. But it's impossible to have a good cakewalk without cakes. Make a cake, bring it with you Saturday as part of the fall festival. Or cupcakes, or, or just pies, or I eat cookies. 
<laughs> oh, he'll raise them, please. Those always are the best. All right, any other announcements this morning? Let's take a moment. As you're able, will you rise? Let's share with each other the peace of Christ. I'm grateful that we're here together in worship. all day, and maybe some Sunday we will, but not this Sunday. If you go ahead and find your seat. It is good to be in a place filled with love, a place with, with hope, a place filled with faith. There is no place I would rather be than right here, right now, with each one of you. Let us worship God together. Lift up your hearts. We lift up your hearts. Good morning. As we open today in worship, I invite you to stand as you are able as we join together singing Trusting Jesus.
Lord and live, or else God might rush like a fire against the house of Joseph. The fire will burn up Bethel with no one to put it out. Doom to you who turn justice into poison and throw righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who judges at the city gate, and they reject the one who speaks the truth. Truly, because you crush the weak and because you tax their grain, you have built houses of carved stone, but you won't live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you won't drink their wine. I know how many are your crimes and how numerous are your sins, afflicting the righteous, taking money on the side, turning away the poor who seek help. Therefore, the one who is wise will keep silent in that time. It is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of heavenly forces, will be with you just as you have said. Hate evil, love good, and establish justice at the city gate. Perhaps the Lord God of heavenly forces will be gracious to what is left of Joseph. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. Our prayer here this morning is, Lord, listen to your children praying. Hymn 305. I invite you to sing along with the choir. This past Friday was National Coming Out Day, <clears throat> an important day in our lives. It's an important day in the life of our church. It began 30 some odd years ago for one primary reason, so that we might say to each other, you are not alone. Yesterday was the 26th anniversary of the death of Matthew Shepard. All of us know the story of Matthew Shepard, victim of a vicious hate crime. Although when he was beaten, he was alone, he was not. For we believe that God was with him, and when he died, he was not alone. For his family, who loved him deeply, was with him. But it reminds us of the importance that we never allow anyone to be alone. The world is filled with people who are feeling alone and isolated right now. We look around us in our communities, and the black and brown folks who feel isolated and alone, who feel targeted. Members of our community who are targeted. Members of immigrant communities who are targeted. We who have felt alone but have come into the light of being our truest selves bear a greater responsibility to ensure that others do not feel alone and that they know the love of Christ is with them regardless of their suffering, regardless of their joy, regardless of their circumstances. And so as we pray today, today as we look at the names of those in our community of faith whom we're praying for, one of the things we pray for is that they know they are not alone. And in those prayers, we also then pick up the phone, send a text, make a call, write a card, to say, God is with you. We are with you. You are not alone. 
If you look on the back of your order of worship, we pray for the following. Pray for our pastor search committee and the work that they are doing to lead us to the next pastor of our church. We pray for Barb Meyer and Deb Payne. We pray for Carmen Serna. We pray for Connie Rees. We pray for Wayne Hanna. We pray for Joel Johnson and his family. We pray for Lynette Bushnell, for Ray Jenkins, for Ricardo O'Reilly. We pray for all the unspoken prayer requests. We pray for those whom we know that are not on this list, but their names are engraved on our hearts, and we pray for them. Would you bow your heads with me? Although we may feel forsaken, God, we are not alone. We have come out into the light of your love, living as our truest selves, loving those whom you have brought into our lives to love. And we are not alone. And we pray, God, that those whose names we have mentioned a moment ago from this list will know, too, that they are not alone. And we pray, God, that those whom we do not know, people who sleep behind our church on Saturday nights, people who come to our doors asking for something to eat, people who are threatened because of their status, we pray that they will know that they are not alone, that we join our hearts, our prayers, and our voices with them. We give thanks to you, God, that we are not alone, that you are present here in this place right now. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus, who came to be God with us, Emmanuel. Amen.
love endures forever. Thank you, choir. And thank you, Alexis, for reading. Let me give you a little inside information here. We threw a curve at Alexis at about 15 minutes before the service started, saying, read this scripture instead. I'm not going to tell you which one, because she did it so well, you'll never know the difference. But thank you so much for reading this. I failed to mention this earlier. I wanted to share this with you. I am flying to California this evening in order to participate in the Association for Continuing uh, Higher Education. See, I, I was president of this group, I can't remember the name anymore. The Association for Continuing Higher Education Annual Conference. These silly people still think I have something to say to them. Uh, I suspect after this meeting they'll say, yeah, we're good, we're good. We're gonna come back. I will be gone until Wednesday evening. Uh, we do have folks in the office out throughout the week. We have some wonderful volunteers who are answering phones for us during our staff transition. Uh, Pam and Tom are in the office at different days during the week. So if you have a need, reach out to us. Let us know. And I look forward to being back with you when I'm back in the middle of the week. I have just finished my second week, though, here at Celebration. And you know, it has been wonderful to be back with you. Although things have changed a little bit since I was last with you. As I just mentioned, the office was almost empty my first week back. Now, Pam and Tom were there in the office some, but there were days when I had the place to myself like Thursday of that first week. I would be alone in the office all day. That should have made the board nervous. <laughs> now, I'm a big boy, and I don't usually react to things that go bump in the night or in the daytime. Now, I was told that it would be pretty quiet. So I thought this would be great. I could get my sermon written, catch up on email, and maybe even finish the book chapters I needed for the next search committee meeting. <clears throat> 20 phone calls later, <laughs> several drop-ins and two requests for help I got to the end of the day with a really rough first draft of the sermon an inbox that was rapidly filling up and a book that sat on the desk mocking me for my ambitions to read it so much for a quiet day the least surprising part of the day were the requests for help as you can imagine we have people come by the church regularly seeking help for a wide variety of needs. The most urgent requests are always for housing support and food. And occasionally we'll receive a request for shelter or for transportation. And rarely, but sometimes, we'll be approached by someone who needs help with their pets. All these requests represent real needs for people whom our economy has left behind. But other than prayer, I couldn't help either of the people who came by that Thursday. And I know there will be others in the coming weeks and months to come who will come to us like they did to Jesus for healing and for help. In all my years of pastoral ministry, however, whether as the senior pastor of a local church or as the agape needle pastor to a congregation of people with many needs, I've never received a request for help from one class of people. I've never had a wealthy person come to me seeking help, unlike Jesus in our story from the Gospel of Mark. This is one of those stories that we need to approach with some care. It's very familiar to those of us who grew up in the church, so we're prone not to hear it. And it's challenging because it has a hard word about wealth and the wealthy. We must also approach this story with care because it applies to each one of us. A rich man came to Jesus with what seemed to be a straightforward question for the Son of God, Good teacher, what must I do to obtain eternal life? Now that's a softball question for a preacher. Apparently it wasn't so straightforward for Jesus. To the surprise of the crowd and the rich man, Jesus gave him a conventional sounding answer. You know the commandments. Don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony. Don't cheat. Honor your father and your mother. That's precisely the response that the rich man should have expected. It was the message he'd heard in synagogue since he was a child. Teacher, he responded, I've kept all these things since I was a boy. Now, I'm not certain what answer the rich man was looking for. Perhaps he wanted confirmation of what he'd been taught by his family and his community. He'd always heard that his wealth was a reward for or a byproduct of his own effort and virtue. He was told that things go well for the good, for people of good character, and poorly for the bad, for those who lack good character and self-discipline. 
The fact that he was wealthy just confirmed to him that he already had what he needed to obtain eternal life. So it must have been a little surprising to hear the next words out of Jesus' mouth. You're lacking one thing. Go. Sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. It's at this point in the story where all of us who have been paying attention start to squirm just a little bit. There's nothing here about belief or faith or grace. Just go sell what you own and give it to the poor. That's not the message the rich man expected. And it's not a message that, frankly, is all that popular today. In fact, it is a message that casts judgment on the very virtues that the rich man had embraced since his childhood. Now, I believe to understand what Jesus is doing, we need to go to the very last verse in that story. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. Now, I want you to think with me a moment. It seems to me that what the rich man was trying to do was the very thing he always did, trying to find a way to get ahead. His riches provided him with every comfort available to him in this life, but he wanted to be certain that those comforts would also be available to him in the next life. He believed that he was entitled to always be first. He believed that he should have the best seats, the best food, the best view, and the best life. One of the unexamined questions of this story is how did this man get rich? Did he work his way up from poverty? Did he inherit his wealth? Was he a grifter? who had struck a corrupt bargain with the authorities? I suspect that the answer to that question resides in the passage from the Hebrew Scriptures that Alexis read for us a moment ago. The prophet Amos called out the wealthy of Israel with these words. Truly because you crush the weak and because you tax the grain and have built houses of carved stone but won't live in them, you have planted pleasant, planted pleasant vineyards, but you won't drink their wine. I know how many are your crimes and how numerous are your sins, afflicting the righteous, taking money on the side, turning away the poor who seek help. It's likely the rich man in our story had become rich by putting himself first, always ahead of anyone else. And now he was trying to do it one more time. If that is true, then that helps me, and I think helps us understand Jesus' response to him about how to obtain eternal life. So, to me, it is confirmed that the man's goal was once more to get ahead by putting himself first ahead of anybody else. Why would he have slinked away at Jesus' words? Because he had many possessions. Now, something I failed to mention that Jesus had for him in the moments before the man walked away, even before Jesus told him to sell everything, we hear these words in the gospel. Jesus looked at him carefully and loved him. Jesus saw that the man's wealth and the me first approach he took to accumulating that wealth revealed the motive behind the man's question. Jesus' response struck right at the heart of the man's system of virtues and declared that he would never attain, obtain eternal life if he continued the path of going first. It was an act of love by Jesus to tell this man the truth. Jesus' next words, in an expression of what I think is good preacher humor, summed up what everybody around him had just witnessed. Looking around, Jesus said to his disciples, it will be very hard for the wealthy to enter God's kingdom. Those words started his disciples. So Jesus told them again, Children, it is difficult to enter God's kingdom. It's easier for a camel to squeeze through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter God's kingdom. The tension of those words nearly broke the disciples. And it has the risk of breaking us. To these words of Jesus, we always seek the exception. Like W.C. Fields, who on his deathbed was encountered by a friend who saw him reading a Bible. And when asked, why are you reading the Bible? He says, I'm checking for loopholes. <laughs> <laughs> there are no loopholes in this eye of the needle that a camel 
a rich person can slip through. Not that Peter didn't try. Peter said, look, we left everything and followed you. Peter's declaration was that he had already done what Jesus said must be done. But even dear Peter misses the point. In this declaration, he's still making the mistake of trying to be first. Jesus' response to Peter has been then misused by the descendants of the rich man. Descendants clothing themselves in their own version of the gospel. Who declare that if we give everything we possess to God, then we'll get a hundred times more in return. And it's kind of like a spiritual return on investment. Charlatans and conmen throughout the ages have used that line to build many faithful people out of their life savings, while those cheats line their pockets and live in gated communities. The words of Jesus are not a spiritual investment plan. I imagine if they were, the rich man would have figured it out and stuck around. But instead, he walked away. Because it all comes back to the last line. But many who are first will be last. And many who are last will be first. Now imagine you like I was as I was writing the sermon. It, the deeper I got into it, the more confusing in some ways it became. Being rich gains us no advantage in the city of God, nor does being poor. So what do we do with the story? Well, first thing we do is we take it seriously. We don't water down or explain away what Jesus said about wealth and entering the city of God. Second, we don't assume that our supposed superior virtues will make us immune from the obsession to get ahead, even at the expense of others. What we do with this story is listen carefully. We don't choose sides. Instead, we say ourselves both in the rich man and the disciples. We embrace the tension that exists between wealth and the city of God. What we do with this story as we watch for and call out the fear of some in our country, that they will no longer be first because they've been told by others that there are those people out there who are trying to take their place. What we do with this story is listen to the words of the late Presbyterian pastor and friend, friend to children, Fred Rogers. It's the knowing that we can be trusted, that we can never have to fear the truth, that deep part of you that allows you to stand for those things without which humankind cannot survive. Love that conquers hate. Peace that rises triumphant over war. And justice that proves more powerful than greed. Because deep down, we know that what matters in this life is more important than winning for ourselves. What really matters is helping others win too. I wish you the strength and the grace to make those choices which will allow you and your neighbor to become the best of whoever you are. What we do with this story is embrace the words of Francis of Assisi. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. What we may learn is that in dying to the desire to be first, we may find the place in the heart of God that we have always sought. This is the good news. This is the gospel of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please pray with me. With open hands and thankful hearts, we offer to you all that is already yours, O Lord. Everything we possess is a gift from you. You so freely give us what we need, and you promise even greater treasures that await us in heaven. Take what we offer and use it for the goodness of your kingdom. Help us share generously with others all that you so graciously give to us. Amen.
saints who around the world and for 2,000 years have gathered at this table to share bread and cup together. Some believing that Christ is fully and truly present in the bread and the cup. Some believing that Christ is remembered 
as we share the bread and the cup. All of them trusting and knowing that the Spirit of Christ is present at this table. And so we join our hearts together at this table. On the night before he died, Jesus sat down at dinner with his friends. And at the beginning of the dinner, he took a loaf of bread. He blessed it. And then he broke it into pieces. And he handed the pieces of bread to his friends. And he said to them, just as I give you this bread, so I give you my life. At the end of the meal, Jesus took a cup. He filled it with wine, and then he shared that cup with his friends, and he said to them, this cup represents a new way of living, of loving one another, of following me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, remember me. We will share the bread and cup this morning by passing them down your pew. I invite those who are going to share the, the cup and the bread with you to come forward at this time. As you receive the bread and the cup, hold it so that in a moment we might share it together as a community of faith.
This is the bread of life, the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. This is the cup of grace, the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Will you join your hearts with me in prayer? To take the bread and the cup is an act of love. It's an act of coming out. It's an act of saying, this is who I am, a beloved child of God. And as long as we share this bread and this cup, none of us will ever be alone. So I thank you. God for giving Christ to us, both within our hearts and in bread and cup, in order that we might be filled up and never be alone. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is I Love to Tell the Story. I invite you to stand as you are able, singing hymn 480, I Love to Tell the Story. <clears throat> spend a few minutes. Let us tell you how glad we are you, here, you are here. Let us get to know who you are. We have some birthdays. Jaylani and George. We don't ask how old they are, but George looks a lot better than you do. That's all I have to say. <laughs> it's so good to be with you this morning. I share with you a benediction this morning that we learned this past Wednesday night at the gathering. And at some point, we will have it up on the screen so you can share it with each other. This benediction, this blessing, are the words of Jesus. When asked the question, 
which is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Go in the love of God, in the fellowship of the Spirit, and with the words of Christ on your lips and in your heart. Amen.